Hi friends, welcome to my channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh. Today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic, vertigo. And I believe it's going to be useful to ENT surgeons, neurologists, neurophysicians, general physicians, general surgeons, and psychiatry residents. Vertigo itself is a big specialty, so I will be dwelling upon only the important concepts and points. What is vertigo? Vertigo is an illusion of self and environment. It's basically a sense of spinning. We need to be very clear about the symptoms which the patient tells. They may give non-specific complaints like dizziness, lightheadedness, imbalance. But we should be sure that it is vertigo, a sense of spinning. Having confirmed that it's a case of vertigo, a complaint of vertigo, how do we approach? Very important point. Once a person comes with vertigo, we need to know whether it is central vertigo or a peripheral vertigo. Peripheral vertigo is vestibular apparatus, the vestibular nerve. Central vertigo is the brain stem and cerebellar structures. Again, if you take peripheral vertigo where the labyrinth or the vestibular nerves are involved, it could be unilateral or it could be bilateral. Unilateral usually produces vertigo because of asymmetric input coming from the labyrinth to the brain. Because of this asymmetric input, brain gets confused and will have a sense of spinning and vertigo. Any unilateral cause like BPPD, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. If it is bilateral, both the vestibular apparatus are damaged and therefore the input, though it is decreased, it is symmetric and therefore a bilateral damage usually will not produce a severe vertigo. They can have oscillopsia, a difficulty in, in coordination between vision and the head especially in the darkness, they can have imbalance. So this is about the peripheral vertigo where you have the unilateral involvement and the bilateral involvement. Central vertigo, this is dangerous because the central cause of vertigo is because of brainstem structures and cerebellum. Example, Wallenberg syndrome. This could be life threatening. So the first and most important point is you need to differentiate whether it is central vertigo or whether it's a peripheral vertigo. Peripheral vertigo is benign and central vertigo is dangerous. But how do we differentiate whether it's a central cause of vertigo or a peripheral cause of vertigo? There are many points, uh, there are about five important points, but the most important point is nystagmus. So I'll be talking more about nystagmus. By looking at the nystagmus, we can differentiate whether it's a peripheral cause of vertigo or a central cause of vertigo. If it's a peripheral cause of vertigo, if the vestibular apparatus, the labyrinth is damaged, what will happen? As I told in the last class, neuro-ophthalmology nuances, the vestibular nerve, vestibular apparatus gets connected to the third nerve nucleus on the same side with the sixth nerve nucleus on the opposite side through MLF. And therefore, when the vestibule is stimulated, the eyes will move towards the opposite side. And therefore, when the vestibular apparatus gets affected, the eyes will move towards the same side and the nystagmus will be towards the opposite side. So, if it's a peripheral cause of vertigo, there will be unilateral gaze with fast phase away from the lesion. Fine? Suppose if it is a central cause of vertigo, what happens? It will be a bidirectional with gaze evoke changes and there could be downbeat nystagmus also. Right. The second important point is the direction. If it's a peripheral cause of vertigo, it will be a mixed vertical torsional nystagmus with the upper end of the eye looking towards the affected side of the ear which is on the lower side. So the mixed vertical torsional nystagmus. Whereas if it is a central cause of nystagmus, it would be purely vertical or purely torsional. 
the peripheral cause of vertigo producing a nystagmus is a mixed vertical torsion it cannot be purely vertical or torsional because the three semicircular canals will contribute to the direction right and third important point about nystagmus to differentiate between peripheral cause and central cause is that in a peripheral cause the nystagmus gets inhibited by visual fixation the visual fixation inhibits the nystagmus and therefore if a person uses frenzel glasses which inhibits visual fixation the nystagmus is well seen so in peripheral cause of nystagmus if you want to see give frenzel glasses it will be well seen whereas if it is a central cause of nystagmus the nystagmus is not suppressed by visual fixation and the fourth important point is the head impulse test what is this head impulse test this is because of vor you need to understand a concept vestibulo ocular reflex when the head moves to one side the eyes moves to the opposite side in an in an opposite direction but of equal amplitude so this is vestibular ocular reflex but in persons where the vestibule is affected the vor gets impaired and therefore when the head moves to one side like this the eyes also will move along with the head so they have to make a correct second to focus on an object example if the patient is asked to focus on this camera turn the head to one side and still focus generally in a normal person whose vestibule is functioning well i can turn the head on one side but still my eyes focusing on the camera but in persons where the peripheral cause of vertigo where the vestibular apparatus gets affected when the head turns to one side the eyes also turns towards the same direction and they have to make a catch up second to look at the camera so once you see this catch up second in the head impulse test it is suggestive of peripheral cause of vertigo head impulse test is negative in a central cause of nystagmus so these are all the four important points of nystagmus by which we differentiate whether it's a peripheral cause of vertigo or a central cause of vertigo first in a peripheral cause of vertigo it is unidirectional with fast phase away from the lesion whereas if it is a central cause of nystagmus central cause of vertigo the nystagmus is bidirectional it changes direction with gaze and there could be downbeat the second important point is that the peripheral cause of vertigo producing nystagmus is never purely vertical or never purely torsional it's a mixed vertical torsional whereas in a central cause of vertigo the nystagmus is either purely central or torsional vertical or torsional third the nystagmus can be inhibited by visual fixation and therefore can be better seen with frenzel glasses in a peripheral cause of vertigo whereas the nystagmus does not get suppressed by visual fixation if it is a central cause of vertigo fourth because of the impaired vor head impulse test is positive there's a correct second in a peripheral cause of vertigo whereas the head impulse test is absent or negative in a central cause of vertigo these are the four important points regarding nystagmus but there are still other points by which we can differentiate peripheral cause of vertigo from central cause of vertigo they are there are other associated clinical features in a peripheral cause of vertigo so there could be a unilateral hearing loss generally there be unilateral hearing cause in a peripheral cause of vertigo but in a central cause of vertigo the hearing loss is not there on a unilateral side because once it comes to the brain stem it goes bilaterally so a central cause of vertigo does not produce a unilateral hearing loss whereas a vestibular cause produces a unilateral hearing loss and then you can have associated clinical findings in the central cause of vertigo like diplopia because three four six nerves can get affected in the brain stem they can have diplopia they can have dysarthria because nine ten nerves 10 12 nerves can get affected you can have dysarthria because cerebellum can cerebellum gets affected they'll have ataxia so these associated clinical findings namely a uh, unilateral hearing loss is in favor of peripheral cause of vertigo whereas other findings like diplopia dysarthria and ataxia are in favor of central cause of vertigo unilateral hearing loss is not present in a central cause of vertigo because once it comes to the brain stem the 
vestibular cochlear nerve goes bilaterally and therefore it does not produce a unilateral hearing loss. Right. Another important point is the Dix Halpeck manual. The Dix Halpeck manual, if we do it, we can see the nystagmus, especially if it is a benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. The nystagmus is well seen. But what is this Dix Halpeck manual and how do we do it and what is the basic pathogenesis? The basic pathogenesis of the BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, is that the autoconia, the calcium carbonate crystals, which are present in the macule, comes to the semicircular canal. So as it travels through the semicircular canal, it induces vertigo and sense of nausea and vomiting along with nystagmus. So we can provoke it, we can provoke it by doing a manual known as Dix Halpike manual wherein the patient is held, turn, the head is turned 45 degrees, ask him to lie down and extend about 20 degrees and then look for nystagmus. If the nystagmus appears, then it's a peripheral cause of nystagmus, especially BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Another important way by which we can find out is the dynamic visual acuity. The basic mechanism of dynamic visual acuity and head impulse test are the same, the basic pathogenesis. It is because of impact vestibulo-ocular reflex. Because of the impairment of the vestibulo-ocular reflex, when you turn head horizontally, there will be catch-up second because it does not move in the opposite direction, that is head impulse test. Whereas in dynamic visual acuity, the visual acuity gets decreased when there is movement, dynamic movement. So when you move head vertically up and down, the eyes do not move towards the opposite side, they move along with the head and therefore it slips one line below the actual line to be seen. And therefore the top line appears blurred, they can see one line below it well. So there may be diminished visual acuity, so on the post positional changes of the head. So this is known as dynamic visual acuity. So dynamic visual acuity is present in peripheral cause of vertigo whereas it is absent in the central cause of vertigo. Then we can do investigations to find out whether it's a peripheral cause or a central cause. In a peripheral cause we do audiometry. In audiometry there may be unilateral sensorineuronal hearing loss. There could be low frequency hearing loss in nameous disease. So when we do audiometry there could be unilateral sensorineuronal hearing loss or low frequency hearing loss as in manias disease. Whereas in central cause of vertigo, we do imaging, MRI brain. By doing MRI brain, we can find out whether there is an any lesion in the cerebellum or medulla oblongata. Example, Wallenberg syndrome. Another sequence which we have to stress in finding out the central cause of vertigo is do MRI brain of internal auditory canal, IAC, to rule out schwannoma. So by all these methods, especially nystagmus, the four points which I have told, the clinical findings, the Dix Halpike manual, the dynamic visual acuity and investigations, we can differentiate whether it's a central cause of vertigo, peripheral cause of vertigo. This is the most important aspect when we approach a case of vertigo. Once we have differentiated, then the rest of things is easy. As I said, Peripheral cause of vertigo, you need not worry, it's not dangerous, it's benign, but central cause of vertigo is dangerous and therefore you have to be alert and that's the most important point, important approach to differentiate whether it's a central cause or a peripheral cause of vertigo. Now let's see the differential diagnosis of vertigo. The differential diagnosis of vertigo includes vestibular neuronitis. In vestibular neuronitis, it is because of infection, usually a viral infection, herpes zoster, what we call it as Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So when you have the vestibular neuronitis, what is the treatment? We give glucocorticoids for about 3 days, we give antiviral drugs, we give vestibular suppressants. I will be talking about it in later also, but here I would like to mention about vestibular suppressants. Vestibular suppressants we usually give for 3 days, maximum for 5 days because when you prolong, when you give on a prolonged basis beyond 5 days, you are hampering, hindering, impairing the central compensation process and therefore generally vestibular sedatives should not be given beyond 3 days, maximum 5 days. So that is about vestibular neuronitis. Now vestibular migraine. 
Vestibular migraine is usually seen in persons having migraine. They can have symptoms of headache or may not have symptoms of headache, but they'll have associated findings. They can have photophobia, they can have phonopsia, they can have other findings of uh, migraine symptoms, they can have extreme sensitivity to motion, especially the pictures. So when you think it's a case of vestibular migraine, as like migraine, you have to give anti-prophylactic migraineous drugs, namely sodium valproate or topramate. So this is about vestibular neuronitis and vestibular migraine. Then we have manias disease. Manias disease, usually they have low frequency hearing loss, they have tinnitus and vertigo. It is due to excess fluid. It is due to excess fluid where you have the endolymph in the inner ear. The treatment consists of diuretics, low salt intake, surgery. It could be ablative surgery or non-ablative surgery like shunt procedures or it could be decompressive surgery. This is about manias disease. Then we have vestibular schwannoma. Vestibular schwannoma is a tumor. It grows very slowly on a chronic basis and therefore the compensation takes place and therefore vestibular schwannoma persons usually do not produce with vertigo. They have associated findings like they can have hearing loss, head impulse test is positive and of course by taking MRI brain and focusing on the internal auditory canal we can diagnose it and treat it by surgery. Fine. But now let me talk about a very important cause of vertigo, the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo otherwise known as BPPV. As the name suggests it is benign. Again as the name suggests paroxysmal it comes and goes. It's very very brief less than one minute hardly 20 to 30 seconds. It's a recurrent vertigo. It is provoked by head changes especially to gravity. So when a person is asked to get up from the supine position to the standing position or when the person extends the head and looks at the ceiling because of the positional changes especially related to gravity they will have severe vertigo. But we need to understand the mechanism why a positional changes causes vertigo in BPPV what is the pathophysiological basis. The pathophysiological basis as I have already mentioned is because of autoconia. The free floating autoconia which is otherwise known as calcium carbonate crystals. They are supposed to be in the utricle but they may get dislodged from the utricle and come to the semicircular canal. So as the person changes the position the autoconia travels in the semicircular canal and induces a nystagmus, severe nystagmus and vertigo. So the basic pathophysiological basis of BPPV is autoconia coming from the utricular macula to the semicircular canals. So this can be provoked by a manual known as Dix-Halpeck manual. So what will be the treatment? Treatment will be again to put back the autoconia from the semicircular canals back to the utricles. So the pathogenesis, the pathology is because of the autoconia coming from the utricle to the semicircular canal and it can be induced by dix halpeck manual. The treatment consists of putting back the autoconia from the semicircular canals to the utricle by a method by a, known as Eplis manual. By a method known as Eplis manual. So by doing Eplis manual, you can put it back from the semicircular canal to the macula. How do we diagnose it? Generally, there are three canals, semicircular canals, so posterior semicircular canal, the horizontal, semi, horizontal semicircular canal and the anterior semicircular canal. The posterior semicircular canal, the, what is the type of the nystagmus? The nystagmus is vertical, torsional, the upper eyeball looking towards the lower end, towards the affected ear. So vertical, torsional, the upper eyeball looking towards the affected lower ear. So vertical torsional nystagmus is highly suggestive of a posterior semicircular canal involvement and this is the most common nystagmus more than 95%. Less than 5% is because of the horizontal semicircular canal where it produces a horizontal nystagmus or it could be because of the of the anterior semicircular canal or superior semicircular canal usually does not produce nystagmus. So this is all about the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It is because of the autoconia coming from the utricle to the semicircular canal induced by dix halpeck manure. The treatment consists of a please manure by putting it back from the semicircular canal to the utricle 
the angel part is like Dick's Halbeck manual, but you turn 90 degrees and again 90 degrees like this so that the nose faces about 45 degrees to the floor and this gets destroyed and the person becomes better. Right. Now we talk about the bilateral vestibular hypofunction. Usually it is seen in due to autotoxic drugs like aminoglycosides. Because both are involved, there is symmetrical symmetrical decrease in the neural output. Because it's symmetrical decrease, it usually does not produce vertigo. It produces imbalance and oscillopsia. Again here the dynamic visual acuity is reduced, the hit is positive, but here it is in both in both sides it is positive because both vestibular apparatus is involved. So head impulse is positive on both sides. And the treatment consists of vestibular rehabilitative positional exercises. Next we come with the central vestibular disorders. As I said, it, it includes the brainstem and the cerebellum. We have to be really careful with this type of vertigo, central cause of vertigo picked up by MRI because it is dangerous. It could be Wallenberg syndrome or it could be cerebellar hemorrhage. Whatever it is, the brainstem and cerebellum are affected. So this is going to be very, very dangerous and we need to be extra careful with this. The treatment, in, the treatment depends upon the type. For example, Wallenberg syndrome, infarction, we give antiplatelets or low molecular weight apparent. Suppose if it is hemorrhage, cerebellar hemorrhage, we give mannitol or we control the hypertension or we get a neurosurgical help. And then finally, we have the psychosomatic and functional dizziness, what we call as the PPD, positional perceptual dizziness because of standing, because of anxiety and autonomic symptoms. They will have psychogenic vertigo, but if you do a neuroautological examination or testing of the vestibular apparatus, it will be normal. The treatment consists of giving antipsychotic drugs, bringing down their anxiety and depression by giving SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, namely fluoxetine. So having understood the differential diagnosis of vertigo, now let's go to the treatment. Before I start talking about the treatment, I need to talk emphasize two points. One, the vestibular suppressants are given only for three days, maximum five days, beyond which what happens, you are trying to impair or hinder the central compensation. So we should not give the vestibular suppressants beyond three to five days, point number one. The second point is that for a case, for all, there are many types of vertigo. So for all types of vertigo, the treatment is not going to be the same. The treatment is according to the type of vertigo. So according to the type of vertigo, the treatment changes. So what are they? Now let's see. We have uh, three, basically three gamut of drugs. One, the antihistamines, which include the mechazine, diamine hydrinate and promethazin. We have the benzodiazepines, namely diazepam and clonazepam. We have anticholinergic drugs like scopolamine patch, which we use for motion sickness. We have physical therapy wherein we use a police manual as a repositioning manual for BPPV, benign positional parapsal vertigo. And for bilateral vestibular dysfunction, we give vestibular rehabilitative exercises. For mania disease, it is diet, a decrease in sodium and diuretics. And for vestibular migraine, we give prophylactic anti-migraine drugs like sodium valproate or topiramate. And for vestibular neuronitis, we give methyl prednisolin. And for psychogenic vertigo, we give SSRI fluoxetine. So as you have seen, the treatment of vertigo depends upon the cause of the vertigo and the treatment changes according to the cause of vertigo. So before I conclude, I would like to stress a few important points. The first point is that when a person comes with vertigo, we see whether it's a central cause or a peripheral cause, Central cause you can pick it up by MRI, most dangerous, you have to be very, very quick in, in giving treatment. The peripheral vertigo is less dangerous, benign. We use head impulse test and dynamic visual acuity at the peripheral, at the bedside and we can make a diagnosis of peripheral cause of vertigo. Second, vestibular suppressants are given only for 3 to 5 days, not beyond that because it's going to hinder, hamper and impair the central compensatory mechanism. 
and the treatment of vertigo is not the same for all cause of vertigo the treatment depends upon the individual cause of vertigo and it varies according to the cause of vertigo so this is such a big specialty but i try to really give all the essential points and i try to cover as much as possible regarding all points of vertigo i really enjoyed giving you this lecture on vertigo and i hope you have also enjoyed it if you have really enjoyed it please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts and i'll meet you with the next interesting topic bye take care